Okay. Um, so I'm really excited about this week's uh, seminar. I'm excited about all the seminars, but this one in particular, because I have had a chance to work with our uh, presenter and then um, uh, excited about working with them in the future. Uh, so our presenter this week is Jason Flower. And I've actually known Jason for quite some time now. Um, we reconnected here at UQ, um, but we actually first met at Duke University, uh, where I believe you were in the, the summer program. Yeah, summer program. And when I was a PhD student, and I was supporting that class. So we've come back around, maybe, I don't want to say how long it's been since then, but a few years have passed, a uh, little water under the bridge since then, and ran into you, I think, at a, at a morning tea here. I was like, what? Uh, and had to try to put names and faces together again. Um, but uh, Jason's uh, work works directly with UCSB, the University of California, Santa Barbara, with MLab, um, which is a, probably many of you have, have heard of their work. Uh, great stuff coming out of that lab. But in particular, he also engages through them with the Weight Foundation and the conservation planning that the Weight Foundation is doing in the um, small island developing states all over the world at this point. Major program, um, major impacts on the ground in terms of development of area-based management tools uh, across the world. So very excited to have him here today to talk about his work on uh, marine spatial planning. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, let's get set up. Okay, hopefully everyone can hear me all right. Uh, so thanks, Daniel, for the, the trailer there. Um, yeah, so I, I work at the University of California, Santa Barbara, as Daniel said, but I've been based in Brisbane since 2018. So um, you probably, many, many people may have seen me uh, coming in and out of here, because uh, I used to be actually in the Marine Spatial Ecology Lab here uh, for a short period. And um, as Daniel said, my lab, we do a lot of work on a uh, number of different things, but especially fisheries and marine spatial planning. And I'm going to be talking about the work we're doing in uh, to design protected areas for offshore waters today. Uh, first up, the acknowledgements. I want to thank, there's a lot of people we work with uh, within my lab and particularly at the Weight Institute. And as Daniel said, we, the Weight Institute fund our work and we also work directly with them. Uh, a big thanks to Jeff Hansen. I'm going to be talking about spatial conservation throughout this. And we use the Prioritize R package that Jeff created, and it's really uh, fundamental to our work. Uh, there's a lot of logos there, just to, and that's not even all of them. So we, the work we do is with in-country partners, so it's really applied work. And to do that, we have to work with a lot of government agencies, NGOs, and partners on the ground. So this is just a flavor of some of those in Micronesia, Bermuda, uh, and uh, the Maldives. So what do we work on? Well, the Weight Institute has um, a very broad focus. They focus on ocean sustainability, um, and they have these four major areas of, that they work through, blue economy, marine spatial planning, sustainable fisheries, and marine protection. And the lab I'm part of really uh, provides them with scientific and technical advice on all of those. So essentially, the Weight Institute is working with governments uh, and uh, communities on the ground in the countries that where they work with and we're providing the scientific and technical advice to help them implement management and policy. And so my focus at the moment today is going to be on the marine spatial planning side of things. This map gives you an idea of uh, the broad scale of the work globally. Uh, so we, we, we have sites the, the site, we started out working in the Caribbean, that's where the Weight Institute started out. So my, I cut my teeth on conservation planning in Montserrat, which is a tiny, tiny Caribbean island. And so that was my first real experience of this. And we are now doing much, much larger scale. As you can see, one of our sites is Federated States of Micronesia in the Pacific, which is a huge expanse of water. Um, I'm gonna be talking a lot today about Bermuda. Uh, but we're, we've got sites, uh, as you see, scattered around the Pacific and even into the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, when they, the countries that are working with the Weight Institute, they all have protection commitments. And so this is why I'm talking today about uh, offshore protected areas, because all of the countries that uh, you see here have uh, a percentage protection that they're going to uh, implement for their, their waters. And to get to these numbers, 20, 30, 20% of waters, you're gonna to have to protect some of your offshore waters. Um, what do I mean by offshore waters? Uh, 
I'm going to give the definition here, which is uh, from paper, but there's actually sort of, uh, I'll come back to this later. Uh, essentially, anything off, offshore is beyond the continental shelf, or if you're sitting on an oceanic island, a slightly different definition, it's beyond about 80 meters, more or less beyond coral reef depth. Uh, this is just like a rough ecological definition. In terms of actual planning, we define that differently in every country because it's more to do with where legislative boundaries begin and end and where it practically makes sense to start zoning differently between inshore and offshore. So why do you want to do an offshore MPA, apart from the fact that they've made protection commitments and are going to have to do this? Um, well, really, human, human activity is expanding into offshore uh, areas. Uh, it's already there. It's been there for a long time in terms of fishing and uh, hydrocarbon extraction. There's oil platforms offshore all over the world. Fishing extends into pretty much the entire global ocean. But there's more and more activities that are taking up space within the offshore environment. Wind farms are now being built further and further offshore. O offshore aquaculture is already happening. And there's deep sea mining, which is a big concern. So putting in these uh, uh, offshore MPAs is going to make, uh, make it so that we can meet protection commitments and obviously also protect biodiversity for the future. This is from the MPA Atlas. It's a few years out of date, but just showing you where MPAs are at the moment. And the point I want to make here is that MPAs already exist in the offshore. Uh, you'll see there's big blue circles and squares, particularly in the Pacific. Lighter blue ones here means that they're not fully protected, but there are MPAs there. So there are large chunks of offshore waters that are protected. But what's mostly been done before is that entire exclusive economic zones have been protected. So there hasn't really been systematic protection of offshore waters. Countries or Particularly, a lot of these are remote islands that belong to, for example, France or the UK. And they've gone, OK, we're just going to protect the whole of the waters surrounding this island. So what we're interested in or what we needed to do with the Weight Institute was actually protect a percentage of waters in a systematic way. And so that's what I'm uh, going to go through in a second. Um, to do that, obviously, you need data. Uh, Data collection in the ocean is always more difficult than on land, I'm going to say. I'm sure terrestrial ecologists would uh, argue with that. But broadly speaking, um, getting data near shore, you can at least get in the water. You can go for a dive. You can use satellite remote imagery. So this is the Allen Coral Atlas um, image that you're seeing here. So they have a global um, atlas of uh, maps of coral reefs. And so you're able to get some data for near shore. Uh, within some constraints. But when you come to the offshore environment, because it's much deeper and it's huge, there's a massive area out there, it's just much more difficult and much more expensive and time consuming and resource intensive to do so. So these are just a couple of methods you might be able to get data. But obviously sending a submersible is not very accessible means for most people. Uh, it's vastly expensive. Uh, this is a Cora you send down to the bottom of the ocean, get sediment samples, but still you've got to have a boat to get out into the ocean. So we have very, very sparse data in the offshore area. So this is one of the challenges. So coming back to the work we're doing, um, I'm going to focus in on Bermuda and give you an example of how we're actually doing the process of designing the MPAs and working with the, the country there. Um, I want to really highlight that Bermuda has a vast ocean area, very small land area. Um, and most of the countries that we're working with, fishing and or tourism are important to the economies. So having a comprehensive marine spatial plan and idea about um, where, where they're going to protect, where it's going to be left open for fishing is really important. Bermuda doesn't have a big fishing industry, 0.25% of GDP, but it's culturally important there. And as everywhere, I think the fishing industry has quite a sway in uh, what happens offshore. So my focus is going to be Bermuda. This is just uh, zooming in to Bermuda. You're looking now at uh, Bermuda's exclusive economic zone. So this is the waters it has jurisdiction over. Uh, the depth contours give you an idea. The, the lighter yellow you see are shallow areas going down to the deepest, darkest blue is the deepest ocean down to about 7,000 meters. Bermuda, the islands, is the small black uh, blob that sits in the middle of all that. So it's a very small land area just sitting on top an oceanic platform. 
And so you're going to see a few maps like that. So just a quick intro to where, what Bermuda looks like. To do conservation, you first need to have some idea of what you want to conserve. So in Bermuda, the, the Bermuda Ocean Prosperity Program, which is uh, Wait Institute are involved in, uh, but is, is really run by stakeholders in the country, they put together their principal goals and objectives for the Marine Spatial Plan. And this is what really helps, helps to guide the marine protected area planning process. And this is just a, a cutout from within those, marine, uh, those goals and objectives. And I focused on the conservation goals and objectives because these are the ones that are gonna be relevant to MPA planning. They knew they wanted to designate 20% of the waters, already mentioned that. It's worth noting that there are a lot of other objectives, but these are not directly conservation related. So these might relate to marine spatial planning more generally, but they're not the focus of what, what we're thinking about when we're trying to put in an MPA or a protected area. So this is the full list of conservation goals and objectives. Well, these are the, the objectives. Um, designate at least 20% of the Bermuda's uh, EEZ as protected area, 20% representation of habitats, uh, protect key species, and then they also wanted to make sure that some of the seamounts were protected. So that's the kind of guiding principles to this. And for those of you who are very familiar with Mark Sound and spatial conservation, this is going to sound all very familiar, but I'm going to talk through the process we did, that we did for this. We did using this in uh, Bermuda. So how do we actually go through the process of choosing which areas we might suggest as the best areas for protection. So what we wanted, what Bermuda essentially wanted from us was some advice, where should these MPAs go? So what they were looking for is something like this map on the right-hand side here, where the green areas represent some areas which could be for protection. How do you get there? You've got to have some data. This is what my friend calls the uh, data sandwich. Um, so there's a bunch of different data features we're going to call them. So this is the stuff you want to protect and a target for each of them. So how much of that do you want to protect? Weighed up against that, you're going to have to have some, you're going to have some impact. So if you put in a marine protected area, obviously you're going to exclude most activities, any extractive activities from that area. And the big one that in most places you're worried about is fishing. So you need to have some data about fishing so that you can avoid impacting uh, fishing as much as possible. And then for those of you familiar with spatial prioritization, this kind of framework looks very familiar, but we use, we use the, um, the R package prioritize R, which is, uh, uh, I'll describe as Mark Sun's younger, hipper cousin, but I'm sure a lot of people would argue about that. Uh, but we like it. it, it works well for us. Um, I have no qualms with other programs. There's a lot of other spatial prioritization software out there. This one worked for us, it's very flexible. And Jeff, who's the package maintainer for our, our uh, Prioritize R and created it, is very responsive if you have problems with it. So strongly recommend it, um, though there are other packages out there. Um, what I want to talk through first is the left-hand side here, the data we're using. Because as I said, in the offshore environment, it's really hard to get data, it's expensive. Uh, and so we don't really have very much. So what can we use? First, just a note about the planning area. So when you're doing these spatial prioritization exercises, you have to define what you're, obviously the area you're planning, planning for. Um, I said the definition of offshore is kind of tailored to each site. So in Bermuda, we, they set out everything beyond the 2000 meter contour. So beyond 2000 meter depth was gonna be offshore. And the reason for that was the nearshore area was just there's so much more going on there. Uh, so there's fishing goes out to about 2000 meters, most of, most of the fishing, bottom fishing particularly. And so that space is hotly contested. There's fishing, they, they wanna put in um, offshore wind farms, they have uh, lots of conservation work going on, they have diving work, they have, uh, sorry, diving, they have tourism. So the nearshore work, nearshore planning process was separated out and done much more at a much higher resolution. So offshore, we were able to use a 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer planning grid. So each of these squares you see, it can be basically selected as in or outside an MPA or, or a prioritized area. Um, 
and that's fine for offshore, but that doesn't just wouldn't have worked for nearshore. So we separated those two processes out. So I said it's really difficult in the offshore to get data. The one thing we do have is half decent maps of the ocean floor of the bathymetry of the ocean. And so uh, what you're actually seeing here, the image on the right hand side is Bermuda's exclusive economic zone rendered in three dimensions. So the bit that you see in the middle sticking high up out of the water is actually where the, the landmass sits upon. And these um, sort of darker shaded uh, mountains in the back, they're actually the sea mounts. So we have some data for uh, what the seafloor looks like. And so we can use this in the conservation planning process. So we've basically followed a recipe that had been put together by um, the IUCN, uh, we did it in 2018, and there's a follow-up paper in 21. And they suggested using depth zones, geomorphology, and bioregions. And I'm going to walk through each of those data sets and how we got them. And particularly important for us that all these data sets are global open access data sets. Because we knew we were going to have to go through this process, not only Bermuda, but we're actually actively doing this in Micronesia and the Maldives at the moment. So we needed a process that was rel relatively easy to reproduce um, and had data available for all those regions. So first of the uh, data set, whoop, don't do that. There we go. First data set is the depth zones. Uh, so two images here. The first one is this sort of cartoon image of what the ocean looks like in terms of species. So why do you want to conserve different depth zones? really just because there's different species as you go down through the ocean. So this is just a way of breaking up the ocean into areas where you'll expect there to be different species groupings. So for Bermuda, we classified the ocean into the two depth zones that were in the offshore waters, the Bethypelagic and Abyssopelagic, uh, and ho so hoping to capture a little bit of the species that are in, uh, the different species that are in each of those two depth zones. The targets for most of these conservation features, it was 20% because they're trying to protect an overall 20% of their waters. So the geomorphology. So this is, uh, as I said, we've got globally, we have uh, pretty, pretty decent geomorphology, uh, sorry, uh, depth data for the ocean. And from that, we can uh, look at the geomorphology and essentially classify the seafloor into different, um, different types. And so this is already published. There's some uh, references down the bottom here, but there's a geomorphology atlas for the, the, the global oceans. Uh, so we were borrowing from this. And so you can see the brown areas in the image are classified as plains. These uh, darker areas that stick up far out of the, mount, the, out of the ocean, as I said, are the seamounts. And these uh, green kind of low-lying little mountains are called knolls. And so we also included these in the conservation planning. We basically set a target for each of those to protect a pro proportion of each of them, with the idea being that, again, you're capturing different biodiversity by protecting each of these different types of geomorphology. And for those of you who probably were kind of naturally more used to a land-based land thinking, you can think of this as, you know, plains on land, hills on land, and mountains on land, and you would expect there to be different species and different biodiversity within each of those areas. So I'm going to talk about seamounts a little bit separately, just because these are, in the, the open ocean, seamounts are known to be these real aggregators of biodiversity. Uh, the little kind of cartoon image here shows you what, what can happen around seamounts. You get ocean currents that are running along, they hit a seamount, they get pushed up, um, and they bring up nutrients from the ocean floor. You get lots of plankton, you then get lots of things that feed on the plankton, and so they're real aggregating areas for biodiversity. And so there's a real urge to kind of try and protect um, seamounts. And in Bermuda, they actually mapped out their seamounts. There's been quite a lot, uh, quite a lot of scientific work, even a little bit in the open ocean. And so they knew exactly where the seamounts were. These are the black dots you see. Um, in countries where we don't have the luxury of having the seamounts mapped out perfectly, there is a global data set on uh, uh, seamounts that we can use. But in Bermuda, we were fortunate enough to have this, ready, uh, this knowledge there. And so they knew they wanted to protect uh, 
as you saw in the goals and objectives, 40% of the seamounts. So the blue areas are actually what they decided to protect. So we went through a process of discussion with the steering committee that were leading the spatial planning process there. And they decided they wanted to protect, they really wanted to protect this newer seamount chain in the Northeast, because that has, um, that's been investigated and has known to have a lot of biodiversity there. Um, they were reluctant to protect nearshore seamounts, particularly the Challenger and Plantagenet ones, which you see are very close to the island. And that's just because there is still some fishing that goes out there. And so that would have been a really, I think, basically politically and socially impossible area to protect. So they, they ruled out the nearshore seamounts, but they did extend protection for the um, Muir seamount chain and the surrounding seamounts up there, Siboney and George, out to 50 kilometers. Now, why do you want to protect an area around a seamount? Well, there's some work done in 2010 by Telmo Morato and colleagues, and they basically looked at seamounts and compared the diversity on the seamount compared to the open ocean. And they found basically diversity dropped off, dropped off as you move away. And out to about 30 or 50 kilometers around a seamount, biodiversity is a bit higher than the open ocean. And then as you go beyond that, the biodiversity drops off quite quickly. So by protecting the area around the seamount and not just the peak and the, the little structure of the seamount itself, you're really protecting the, the, the biodiversity that's aggregating around it. So the final bit of data that went into this data sandwich that I spoke about um, is bioregions. So these are commonly used in conservation planning as a way of breaking up the world into different biogeographical regions. And then you set a target and say you want to protect a percentage of each of those. This works nicely if you're doing things at a global scale, but you'll see these are two examples of bioregion maps. Um, all of these are really not applicable at the EEZ scale. So when you come down to working at a finer scale, they just don't work because a country is going to be within a single bioregion. So it's not helping you break up the ocean. So what do you do? Uh, well, we went to the literature and luckily someone far smarter than me had thought about this before. And they published the paper actually looking at protecting uh, Brazil's biodiversity, uh, marine areas. And they had kind of the similar problem. They wanted to break it up into different bioregions. Uh, they termed them pelagic zones when they'd done this. So what they did was get data. And again, this is freely accessible data via BioOracle. So this has environmental data for the world's oceans uh, that you can just go out and download. Uh, and this includes things like chlorophyll, nutrient content, temperature, salinity, and pH. And then you run uh, what's called an unsupervised classification on this. And this essentially clusters your data and what you get out is something like this. So you break, it, uh, it pull, pulls the data into areas that are um, slightly different environmental conditions. And so these three categories, these three, what we'll call the pelagic zones, um, have very slightly different environmental conditions across the range of parameters that were input into this. Uh, and these, these arrows just show you that these different groups of variables are slightly higher in one compared to the other. And you can see, for example, the blue, the light blue area in the south of the EEZ in general has higher mean temperatures, max temperatures, and that's because it's nearer the equator. So this just gives us another way of breaking up the ocean. And again, we set a protection target of 20% for each of those zones. So trying to just capture these different environmental conditions throughout the ocean. So that's all the conservation features, the, the data that I want to talk about uh, that we're trying to protect. Uh, so these are listed down the left-hand side of this table here. And then along the top, I've put the objectives again that I spoke about earlier. And that what, the reason I'm showing this is that these features that we're trying to protect are really tied in to helping us meet the conservation objectives. So the whole point in us doing this conservation planning exercise is to try and help uh, meet the, the, the planning objectives that have come down through this marine spatial planning process. So that's all the data about things we're trying to protect. How about the things we're trying to avoid protecting? So 
one of their objectives in the marine spatial plan was also to make sure that fishers still had access to their fishing grounds essentially uh, and so we need some data as i said on where fishing is happening so coming back to the data sandwich we've gone through all the features the stuff we're trying to protect on the left hand side there i'm going to focus in on this part the what, what we're trying to minimize the impact to so Again, we, we were trying to mainly look for global data sets that we could use across multiple countries. Uh, and so we looked to Global Fishing Watch, who also uh, we, work, we work closely with. What you're seeing here is data from Global Fishing Watch, which has uh, data, again, for the global oceans about fishing and types. You can, you can actually go down, down, download not just how much fishing is occurring in terms of um, effort. You can pull it out by different countries fishing, uh, different types of fishing in terms of the, the gears they use. So whether it's uh, long lines, whether it's trawling and so on. What you're seeing here is the map for Micronesia. So this is one of our sites where we are using this data. Um, and the, the lighter colors, the lighter yellow indicates more intense fishing. So you see for a country like Micronesia where there is a lot of fishing going on, this is really useful data set. If we take a look at the same data, so this is the mean of 2017 to 2021. Um, you see for Bermuda, there's really very little data, the white areas where there is no actual data. And the reason for this is this Global Fishing Watch data set relies on AIS. So it has every boat, every large boat has an AIS tracking device on it, but smaller boats don't. So Bermuda, it's mainly smaller, what you would call small scale or artisanal fishing. And so this, this data set doesn't work. So what can you do in this circumstance? Well, we were lucky that the Weight Institute, when they go and engage with countries, they go out and do ocean use surveys. So Bermuda, they'd already gone out and they've actually got spatial data on how people use the ocean, how people value the ocean, not just for fishing, but for recreation, for boating, diving, and all sorts of uses. And it's a pretty extensive data set. And you can actually go online to the Bermuda Ocean Prosperity website and see that data and probably download it. I, I suspect it's also available. So we were using that data for fishing. Uh, we had a commercial, they separated out commercial fishing and recreational fishing. And you see that the fishing intensity is really concentrated around the platform, around the nearshore area. Uh, most of the offshore area is, is very infrequently visited. But that we put those maps together and we were actually going to use those in the prioritization. So this is what we're trying to minimize the impact to, minimize the impact of fishing. So if I come back to the data sandwich again and see how this all fits together, we've talked through the features and the targets. So this is the stuff we're trying to protect and how much of it we want to protect. We're going to try and minimize the impact of fishing and we're using the prioritization uh, software I spoke about, prioritizer. And so what you get at the end is what we were looking for, which is this map of priority conserv conservation areas. Uh, the green areas being the areas that potentially uh, would be optimal to protect. So these meet the conservation targets we laid out. So protecting 20% of bioregions, of pelagic zones, of depth zones, of, and 100% uh, of the seamounts. And then uh, they total up to 20% of the offshore planning area. And these minimize the cost, minimize the impact to fishing. And you'll see that's kind of clear because most of the areas that have been chosen are pushed further offshore. So most, if you remember from the, the fishing heat map, if I go back here, it's very intensely red around the, the middle, around close to the island. This area has not been selected because there is a lot of fishing goes on there and it would be costly, it would be have a bigger impact to try and protect that area. But these areas, what this table is showing you is that these areas meet all our conservation targets or actually exceed them. So we can, we can meet the conservation goals without having to impact fishing too much. So this is the system we're using. Uh, we've used in Bermuda and we are using in Maldives and um, Micronesia at the moment. Um, this will be really familiar to a lot of people who've done spatial prioritization before. Uh, it's, for us, it's been really important, as I said, to have a reproducible method uh, that's using global and op open access data sets because we're using them across multiple countries. Um, we do all our, well, 
I do all my data processing in R and R Studio. And one of the advantages to that is we work closely with stakeholders when we're developing these, these plans. So what I showed you is just one scenario. Uh, I think for the offshore in Bermuda, I, I'm gonna say around at least 20. Um, the near shore in Bermuda, at least 100. So you, you iterate through these maps because people go, okay, what if we protect more of this and less of that? What if we want the zones more over here or more clumped and or more dispersed? So you end up running a lot of these. And so you end up with a lot of different uh, scenarios. And the, one of the advantages of running this all in our studio, our markdown, is that each time we fiddle with the code, I can just rerun it and it pops out a PDF report. And in that report is all the information I just showed you. It has all the information about the data that we're using. Uh, it has all the information about the, the, sorry, the final map. And we also have some diagnostics, which tell you the representation of how much is protected. So this has been really important for us. Now, I think a lot of these spatial prioritization talks here often finish at that point. I'm just gonna go on for a few more minutes just to explain what comes after. So in Bermuda, where we're furthest along, uh, we're kind of still sitting at the beginning of this process, but what happens is the steering committee who are leading the marine spatial planning process there, uh, they sit down, they look at the plans, they, sorry, they look at the prioritization outputs they've got, and they also look at all the data, and they then start drawing zones on a map. And those zones, go up for public consultation. They come back to the steering committee. If you're lucky, they go out for another public consultation. It really depends on how long this whole timeline takes. And then they come back to the steering committee. Uh, and at each stage, the steering committee has to consider all those public comments and try and integrate them and change the zones based upon that. So this is quite a lengthy process. Bermuda is just about to release these plans for uh, public consultation, which will be a 60 day window. They'll have to comment on that. And then it's gonna come back to the steering committee. And at each of these stages with the steering committee, they will often ask us for advice. Obviously we've been working closely with them at this point on the spatial prioritization part I just spoke about. But along the way, when they're redrafting the plans, we'll often get called in to help them choose, uh, help them uh, redraft them according to their, their wishes and that also meet the, uh, the many demands of the public and all the stakeholders. The final part is the tricky part. It's got to go to government and get through government. So at that stage, the, they'll be passing them uh, a full set of marine zoning plans uh, and there will be legislation to go with that. Uh, and this, this is um, a bit I know perhaps less about, but I know it's somewhat fraught because this is very much contingent upon who's in power at that point in time and if, they're, uh, if they've got the political willpower to follow it all through. So it's a really interesting process to be, to be able to observe this. As I said, Bermuda, which we're actually the furthest along, we're still at the beginning here, but we did observe this process in Montserrat uh, when we did it. Uh, just a final note. Uh, so as I said, Bermuda's just kind of drafted up their plans. And if anyone's doing uh, social media stuff, please don't share this just yet. This has been released to the public, but um, they haven't actually taken out stakeholders in Bermuda yet. So this is what you're seeing on the right here is the actual draft map that the uh, steering committee has put, put together based upon the prioritization output that you see on the left-hand side, which you, we've talked through. And you'll see for the offshore area, they've really actually followed the prioritized area quite closely. So these green um, area, uh, shapes these uh, in the, the draft plan are fully protected MPAs. They're proposing as fully protected MPAs. And the, the lighter, sorry, the, the orange color uh, labeled A3 there, it would still be highly protected, but they chose to not fully protect that because there is some, um, I think there's some long line fishing that goes out there and they didn't want to totally uh, make that off limits. That's a seamount there, uh, which is why that's protected. So you can see these prioritization outputs really can have a strong influence on where uh, the final zones are drawn and, and, and where they're going to go. Uh, with a note of caution that this is 
draft one of potentially very many. So this is, hasn't seen the public yet. This hasn't seen redrafting. So the final result can often look really uh, quite different. But I think it's positive at this, this stage. So I've been through quite a lot. Uh, I just want a couple of messages to take home with you maybe uh, of what I've been through is that hopefully I've been able to show you that we've, we've made, have this reproducible open system for prioritizing areas for protection in offshore waters. Uh, I've put, we want more and better data. I don't think there's an ecologist out there who's been involved in decision-making who's gone, great, we've got all the data we need. Don't, don't bother getting any more. We always want more data. That being said, I think we can do this offshore zoning process with the data we have. We can uh, think about where to put marine protected areas. Uh, kind of point I touched on there, the zoning is really challenging when the space is contested. So I think in Bermuda, the offshore area, the zoning of it has been relatively easy. Uh, I haven't mentioned much about the nearshore process, but it's been a way more complicated process. Like I said, we did many, many more scenarios. And in the end, they actually kind of ignored the spatial prioritization outputs and decided to draw their own zones, the experts there, which I was super excited about after spending about six months working on it. Uh, that being said, they did use a lot of the data, the underlying data that we'd used in the spa spatial prioritization process. So it wasn't, it wasn't totally uh, wasted effort. The final point that it's probably clear to a lot of people, but I think it's worth making is that a prioritization does not make an MPA. The, the, the final MPA output, it's got to go through a lot of public consultation. This is just one of the inputs into that process. Um, and so with that, uh, I've talked a lot. I hopefully, uh, hopefully it's been understandable. Um, I'm going to finish there. I'll leave my email address up there. If anyone's got any questions, comments, I'd be very open to them. And uh, I'd love to hear about anybody else who's going through similar woes of offshore marine spatial planning or nearshore marine spatial planning. Uh, I'd love to hear from you. Thank you.